This evening, we want to talk about the wonderful word of life. Open your Bibles, if you will, to John chapter 1, as that we will look at verses 1 through 18. That's John chapter 1, 1 through 18. So thankful that you have tuned in with us tonight as we try this as our midweek Bible study. While you're opening your Bibles to John chapter 1, the land of Persia was once ruled by a very wise and beloved Shah who cared very greatly for his people and he desired only what was best for them. One day he disguised himself as a poor man and he went to visit the public baths. Now the water for the baths was heated by a furnace in the cellar. And so the Shah made his way down to that dark place to sit with a man who was tending the fire. The two men got to become friends. They shared the coarse food, and day after day the ruler went to visit the man. The worker became very attached to this stranger because he came where he was. One day the Shah revealed his true identity, and he expected the man to, to ask him for a gift. But instead, he looked long into his leader's face and with love and wonder in his voice, he said, you left your palace and your glory to sit with me in this dark place, to eat my coarse food and to, to care about what happens to me. On others, you may bestow your gifts, but to me, you have given yourself. You know, as we think about what our Lord has done for us, we can echo that very sentiment that that fire tender had. I mean, what a step our Lord took when he came from heaven to earth, from the worship of angels to the mocking of cruel men, from glory to humiliation. Oh, how the word became flesh, and he dwelt among men that they might see the glory of God. You know, the gospel according to John it's so different from the others because it had a different purpose. You know, when Matthew wrote, he presented the Messiah, the Messiah of the Jews. You know, when Mark wrote, he, he presented the exalted servant. You know, when Luke wrote, he presented the Son of Man. But when John wrote, he told us who this Messiah was, who this servant was, and who this Son of Man was. He was the Son of God. You know, the Gospel according to John is unique also in that it destroys many of the philosophies of men regarding the Son of God. There is Gnosticism. Gnosticism had infiltrated the Christian world of John's time. But the Gnostics, they had claimed to have superior knowledge into the things spiritual. They would claim special knowledge not known by others. Why, they even gleaned this knowledge through their study of traditions, scriptures, and wisdom of so-called learned men. The Gnostics taught that salvation came through knowledge and not really believing and obeying the word of God. But Gnosticism had its foundation in the philosophy that really all matter is evil. Why, in fact, they believed the human body was inherently evil. This led to a very false view of Christ's incarnation and atoning work. There were several views within Gnosticism that I think are very pertinent because the gospel according to John destroys them all. You had the Ebionites who denied the deity of Christ. To them, Christ was just a mere man. The Docetics denied his humanity. Why, they taught that Jesus did not even have a body, that he was just a visionary. There was no flesh and blood. The Serinthians, they separated Christ from, from the man and held to a view that states that Christ did not become a man until he was baptized, in which the Spirit of Christ descended on him and that his Spirit left him at his crucifixion, that, that Jesus just died a mere man. But you see, the Gospel according to John here obliterates all of these concepts and, and many more that they, even the modernists today might hold. And so Jesus becomes flesh for us. He is the wonderful word of life. Let's read 
John 1, 1 through 3, and then we'll talk about it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Did you notice those first three words, in the beginning? You've heard that before. In Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, like Moses, there is no defense of God's existence here. It's just a statement of fact. Either God created the universe and all that is in it, or the universe created itself. Of course, that's preposterous. Because matter is not eternal, according to the third law of thermodynamics. But this shows that with God, there was a beginning. Not an evolution, as some of the schools are teaching today. But in the beginning was the Word. Did you notice that it's capitalized? Means it's a noun, person, place, or thing. But here, the Word, the executor of God's will, the communicator of God's will to mankind. Words are conveyance of thoughts and ideas. The Word was there in the beginning. He was there exceeding the very will of God, verse 3, executing the very will of God, verse 3. In Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. In Revelation 1, in verse 8, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Ephesians 3, 9 tells us, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. You see, the word of God came to communicate to man God's will. You know, the descriptive use of God is to describe Jesus, the word. You see, Jesus is not eternally the son. For him to be the son, he must be born. Before he came to this world, he was simply known as the Word. You know, at that particular time, it was God, Word, and the Holy Spirit. But after Jesus came and put on flesh, John 1, 14, it became God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Word came to reveal God's Word. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, and John 14, 6. It says, the Word was God, the second person of the Godhead. You know, the deity of Jesus is unquestioned here. He was not a God, as some of our religious friends might teach, but was God. The deity of Jesus is unquestioned here, right? The imperfect tense of the Greek language supports the very sense of a continual godhood. You know, the effect was always and continues to be. You know, there are pertinent passages that are in order here that, you know, Micah, Micah 5, 2, he prophesied of the eternal nature of the word. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. The Hebrews writer tells us the word was without father, without mother, without descent, without neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. Abideth a priest continually. Hebrews 7. In verse 3, you know, even Jesus himself prayed in John 17. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. You know, Thomas once said to Jesus, when he had demanded the evidence to prove that that was the Son of God. And once he saw the evidence, he said, my Lord and my God, John 20, 28. And he was not rebuked for saying so. Because in him dwells the 
fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2 9. Let's go to verses 4 through 13 now. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, the nature of God is life. He is life giving and life producing, both physically and spiritually. But the greater importance is placed on the spiritual life, isn't it? The great, the creator of all life is the sustainer of all life. Hebrews 1, 3, where he upholds all things by the word of his power. You know, the creator and the sustainer also brought to mankind life through the light of revelation. You know, Jesus stated that the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and notice, and they are life. John six sixty three. He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. You know, the only way to have life is to be seen in the Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he hath not the Son of God hath not life, 1 John 5 and verse 12. Let's read verses 14 through 17 now. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is before, before me, but for he was before me. And of this fullness have we all received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You see, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, who was with God and was God, became flesh. Notice that it does not say that the Word descended on flesh, as the Gnostics teach, but the Word took on flesh. He put flesh on himself. The Creator became a part of his creation, right? When he became man, he dwelt or literally pitched his tent or tabernacled, if you will, among us. I believe there's some pertinent passages here that apply as well. Second Corinthians 8, 9. For ye know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that, he, that ye, through his poverty, might be rich. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, the very prophecy of the Lord being born says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Romans 1, 3 and 4, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In Hebrews 10, 4 through 10, it says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering that thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which he will, will we all are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. In Isaiah, or 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of God. God was manifest in the flesh, 
justified in his spirit, seen of angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory. As a man, he came to, to his own people, but they did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave the right of war, sonship to God. When the word became flesh, he took on him all the attributes of flesh and was in all points tempted as we are yet with, without sin. Philippians 2, 6-8. Paul said that the word emptied himself and humbled himself. You know, some will even ask how God could be righteous for judging man based on his transgression of God's will. Well, the answer is God has not only provided a way, but he has lived that way. He has now committed all judgment unto the Son. John 5 and verse 22, it says, For the Father judges no man, but had committed all judgment unto the Son. Of course, Acts 17 and verse 31, because he has appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he had given assurance unto all men, and that he had raised him from the dead. Notice with me verse 18 now. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. If you had seen the Son, you, you've seen the Father. In fact, we can go to John chapter 14 and we can notice there how important it was that Jesus becoming flesh, saying that, you know, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Notice what he says, verses 8 through 10. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest that thou then showest the Father? Believest not that, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, he says, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. We know the Father because Jesus declared him to us. Jesus is God's unique son, or only begotten son, but we can become sons of God too. You know, the results of being his sons are these. We share the blessings. We share the privileges of his family. We have gained an inheritance, if you will, First John 3, 11. We stand as representatives of God's ourselves. We are ambassadors to show God to others that the way that we live is the way that God lived, because Jesus came to show us God. It cost him everything, but now we can be his family too. One has well written that he descended that we might ascend, John 6, 38 and John 14, 3. That he became poor that we might become rich, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. In James 2, 5, he was born that we might be born again. John 1, 14 and John 3, 2 and 7. He became a servant that we might become sons. Philippians 2, 7 and Galatians 4, 6 and 7. He had no home that we might have a home in heaven. Matthew 8, 20, John 14, 2. That he was hungry that it, we might be fed. Matthew 4, 2, John 6, 50. He was thirsty that we might be satisfied, John 19, 26. He was stripped so that we might be clothed, Matthew 27, 28, and Galatians 3, 27. He was forsaken that we might not be forsaken, Matthew 27, 26, and Matthew 28, 20. He was sad that, that we might become glad, Isaiah 53, 3, Philippians 4, 4. He was bound that we might go free. Matthew 27, 2 and John 8, 32 through 36. He was made sin that we might be made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He died so that we might live. John 5, 24 and 25. He came down that we might be caught up. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Oh, the wonderful word of life. 
who was with God, who is God, who took on flesh and dwelt among us, taught, healed, forgave, was crucified for our sins, was buried, was raised again for our justification, who ascended on high for our hope, and now reigns from heaven over his spiritual kingdom, the church. Thank you for tuning in.